Ladies and gentlemen, fellas, 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 welcome back to the channel. And today we're looking at a strategy that I've been excited to do. And yesterday, somebody in the Discord, get into the Discord if you have not already, uh, gave me the idea and kind of urged me in doing a zero wide receiver video. So what is zero wide receiver strategy? And you might be familiar with zero running back strategy. And before we dive exactly into what it is, welcome. Welcome to the channel, everybody. Fellas, welcome to the channel. Lady fellows, the 0.01% the of the people that, I'm not even kidding or exaggerating, a month that are female that watch this, Shout out to you as well. I hope you're all enjoying your days today. Be sure, be sure to hit that big old subscribe button. If you've ever seen my content before, whatever it might be, if you like this video and this is the first one that you're seeing, please roam around the channel. I have these draft analysis type videos. I also have a ton of, ton of deep dive information on positions, on rankings, on best, worst, busts, values, all that stuff that's already coming out. And there's going to be a load more as we approach the summer months of June, July, and the big one. August. So hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell. I greatly, greatly appreciate that. Get into the free discord. There's a free discord down below as well as free rookie rankings. You can get all of those. I'll be sending out my PPR rankings for my top 150. My first run at those, I'll be sending those out as well to all the people who get the rookie rankings below, but get in the discord totally free. There's close to hundred people in there now after we opened it up just two days ago, I'm sure there's going to be up to a thousand plus people once the season starts So get in there, chat around that's down below. But today we are talking through the zero wide receiver strategy and zero running back strategy. For those of you that are not familiar is a strategy that started to come into place a few years ago, and it's really a contrarian strategy. And what contrarian just means is you're going against the grain. You're trying to do something that not many other people are going to do. So in the long run, it will likely benefit you when things that people are expecting to happen don't happen. And usually humans believe because of just human emotion and rationality in general, that what we think is true is going to be true. And if the group think thinks that something is true, that it's just automatically going to be true. But there's a huge margin of error in there that is not accounted for by most human beings. So when you're being contrarian, you're going against that and you're betting on the fact that that margin of error is bigger than what people expect, which it usually is. Now, the downsides for you is that it's usually such a small percentage in general or a smaller percentage than majority. So you'll lose most of the time when you go with this decision. But when you hit, when you get that decision right, if it's a 30% accuracy and you actually hit on that 30%, you're going to win much, much more often because less people are just likely to do it because of the fact that they go with the group think and they try and take the majority side because they think that it's a 99% outcome when really it might only be a 75% outcome. So zero running back strategy developed. And what it was, was you don't draft a running back until the earliest the fifth round. Your first four picks are going to be a wide receiver or a tight end and only an elite tight end. So basically for your first four picks, you're either getting four wide receivers or you're getting three wide receivers and like a Travis Kelsey, three wide receivers and like a George Kittle, that sort of a start. And the thinking here was that during the season, there's going to be a lot of handcuffs and there still are every single year that you can pick up these handcuffs when running back injuries occur or just stream them on the waiver wire or get them at round five or later in your draft. And those guys can take over as the lead back. And any single year that this does indeed happen, you have the opportunity to then have three top wide receivers and or a top tight end on your roster. And now if you get one or two of these running back waiver guys to hit and just really one big one hits off for you as a top 15 back, even a top 10 back, you're in a really good position now to control your draft. Not only control your draft, but control your league. And there was research done and it's really an anti-fragile approach. You can look up the definition. I can pop it up on the screen here if you, if you would really like to know it but it pretty much just says that you're in a situation now where you have high upside and high floor wide receivers. And now all you're getting at your running back positions from five on is high upside guys. And if one or two of those dart throws end up hitting for you, you're in a really good spot now. And there's been a lot of research done on championship winning fantasy football teams. And what you end up finding in these championship winning football teams is that there's been some top running backs that were added late in the season, midway through the season. You think Alvin Kamara, you think Jordan Howard, you think Kenyon Drake of the past few years, even David Johnson down the stretch four or five years ago. So that's a running back for each of the past five years that was really a top 10 running back down the stretch. I'm sure there's a ton more that I'm not thinking of at this exact moment. Miles Sanders last year, you can think about him. He was drafted later in drafts as a rookie running back out of Penn State last year. These are all guys that were there for you in like the sixth, the seventh, the eighth rounds or later, or you just pick them up on waivers. So that's the whole idea of zero running back approach. You can get valuable guys, or at least the thinking is most years you can get valuable guys in the later rounds, or at least in the mid rounds, and you can load up on those guys and it allows you to get stud wide receivers. But this year, this year, I'm going to make a video on zero running back approach. I'm not sure how viable it actually is going to be, but I think zero wide receiver approach is very viable. And this stuff that you see over my shoulder is a draft that I just did with the zero wide receiver approach. I took the exact same strategy. Do not draft a wide receiver until the earliest round five and then draft whatever you want. But before that draft running backs or high upside tight ends. So I'm either going to have four running backs for my start or three running backs and a high upside tight end insert Travis Kelsey's name here and or George Kittle. Let's get into the actual draft itself. And it was 14 rounds. It's a 12 team PPR format drafting on fantasy pros, uh, their draft simulator, but it's also with the expert consensus rankings of 60 different experts. And within those 60 experts, I believe if you have a, a person from a specific site, they're going to take all that site's ranking. So it gets even more condensed. Like there's probably a hundred plus experts, but I'm going to look at this. I ended 
up doing a random order for myself and I ended up getting fifth. And now fifth is an interesting spot. And I think sixth is even more interesting because that, that's the, the point where you start to consider taking me personally, like Joe Mixon over Michael Thomas and Devontae Adams is, is for me uh, for sure going to happen. I'm, I'm prioritizing running backs more times than not. And especially in this draft where I'm going zero wide receiver, I'm 100% prioritizing running backs. So once again, this is a, a, a strategy video where I wanted to see how it turned out. It actually turned out a lot better than I expected. But just to let you know, I, I purposely went through and drafted zero wide receivers in my first four picks. So if there's a guy on the board that you said, how did you not take him over him? I'm purposely going through to see what the depth looks like later on. So with the fifth pick in the round, you saw Alvin Kamara went third in this draft, Zeke went fourth, and then Dalvin Cook ends up falling to me at fifth. I have Dalvin Cook as my running back four, right behind Zeke, Saquon, and McCaffrey in reverse order there. And right now, Dalvin Cook, I feel good about him in the first round. There's not much to say, right? He had the 14 games last year. He gets hurt down the stretch. He had the 12th best run blocking unit ahead of him. He was 10th in reception, sixth in receiving yards. And that's with missing two games at the running back position. So he really cemented his role last year as a game flow independent back, a guy who's just going to go out there, whether they're trailing, catch six balls for you. If they're leading, it's probably because he has 80 plus yards on the ground and a touchdown or two. And the way that they want to run their offense this year is probably going to be very similar to last year. Based on shipping out Stefan Diggs, uh, based on getting Justin Jefferson, it doesn't seem like it's going to just turn into a dynamic downfield offense. You also have no Laquan Treadwell there anymore, which is a smaller piece, but he's also a downfield weapon that now is going to Atlanta. So it seems like the same exact situation for Cook. Now it just really becomes a matter of if he can stay healthy. It is his job by far. He's probably going to push 65 to 70 percent of the snaps, but those snaps more times than not, he's going to see a high touch rate on those snaps. We mentioned just their their drops in both Stefan Digg and, Diggs and Laquan Treble down the field. They added Tajay Sharp, so that's not much down the field for them outside of Justin Jefferson. But then in the draft, they did add a decent amount of offensive line depth. They drafted three offensive linemen, notably in the second round, a tackle, a zero Cleveland. So they took a, a second round tackle, a, a sixth round tackle, and a seventh round interior lineman slash center. So they really try to bolster their offensive line. Nothing in the draft or free agency really suggests that they're trying to throw the ball more downfield. This seems to be Dalvin Cook's team once again, and health is his only question mark and I'm going to be feeling really good about him. So now we get back around to the second pick for myself. And once again, we're going zero wide receivers. So these first four picks are either running backs or tight ends. And I picked four running backs, spoiler alert, as you can see, my second pick was at pick 208 in this draft. It was the 20th overall pick. It was Josh Jacobs. I currently have Josh Jacobs as my overall 18th player on the board in PPR formats. I have him as my running back 11. So seeing him fall two spots to me right here, I like a lot. You can see that right before my pick, there was a stretch of wide receivers that went off the board. These yellow players right here in Tyree Kill, uh, DeAndre Hopkins, Julio, they all fall to the second round, which is something you're seeing more and more commonly when you're drafting with experts, as this is the expert consensus rankings of fantasy pros. Like I have DeAndre Hopkins ranked overall as my wide receiver four, but he's my 12th player on the board right now. I have Julio ranked overall as my wide receiver three, ninth player on the board. Tyree Kill, my wide receiver five, 13th player on the board overall. So these guys fall a little bit more than what my rankings are, but it's by like one or two picks. And honestly, at those points, if I want to go back to back running backs, and that's usually what I'm trying to do here in terms of just building out a line up, not specifically just rankings. That's probably what I'll do. I'll go back to back running backs. And then you end up whiffing on these guys. They fall a little bit later. So I ended up getting to Josh Jacobs earlier in this off season. He was ranked as my number eight overall running back. He, he went from number 10 to number eight. Now he's at number 11. And there's, there's concerns. Everything they've done in the off season is pretty much saying that uh, we don't want you to catch the ball. And now things can change once week one comes, the preseason comes camp, whatever it might be, get some coach speak out of John Grudem. Although it's tough to trust that because we saw last year, the coach speech for Josh Jacobs was, yeah, he can catch the ball. We're going to let him catch the ball after the bye week. Yeah, he can catch the ball. He's going to start catching the ball. And he saw the same amount of targets on the stretch. He would catch one ball a game and it just wasn't great overall. Now you have a situation where everything they've done this off season is improve the pass catching running back abilities. They signed Jalen Richard to a two-year extension for $7 million. They draft Lynn Bowden in the third round. They want to use him as a running back is what the early notions are. For guys like Antonio Gibson and Lynn Bowden, it makes sense for the team to say, use them as a running back because running backs just get paid less. The market is less. So just business-wise, it makes more sense to use these guys guys as running backs. They can use them as wide receivers if they want to, but saying that the running backs is a, a good business decision for the organization themselves. But Lynn Bowden is now back there, somebody who's going to threaten in a pass catching role. And then they signed Devontae Booker, which yes, Devontae Booker is not somebody you should be really uh, uh, scared about. And he, honestly, he might be cut before the season starts. But getting Devontae Booker and, and all these other guys, it's showing that they don't trust his pass catching abilities. DeAndre Washington is gone. That's 40 plus targets gone to the Kansas City Chiefs. That's a good plus. That happened early in the offseason. So you're like, oh man, they actually like Josh Jacobs. They're going to use him more. It was right after they signed Jalen Richard. Okay, obviously you need a backup. They like Jalen Richard, but DeAndre Washington is 40 plus targets are gone. 
Well, here comes Lynn Bowden to fill all those. Well, here potentially becomes Devontae Booker for depth pieces, even if one of these backup running backs gets hurt to fill some more of those. But those are obviously just a downside to Jacobs. The upside is that he's going to be a guy who, if he stays healthy, is going to push for 300 plus just carries overall, not even counting his receptions. That can just be upside. If you think the offense is better because of everything that they're drafting, three wide receivers, Henry Ruggs with their first overall pick, getting veteran Jason Witt and Darren Waller stepping into his second year with the team. I do think there's a lot of upside for him. That's why you see him at my second pick. Before I keep going, in my completely non-biased opinion is that this video is going great. But before I keep going, please do hit the subscribe button. Big old one just popped up on the screen. Bottom right hand corner down there somewhere, subscribe button, notification bell. It allows me to reach more people. So if this is the first time you're seeing me or you just like my content in general, odds are you got to see me because other people were paying it forward, hitting the notification bell, hitting the subscribe button and get into the free discord. It is linked down below. Stop wasting time. It's a one click button group chat. We're all in there talking getting advice, hanging out, get in there right now. Now my third pick comes around and again, we're going tight ends or we're going running backs. And what do you know? You can see right here, these red little boxes, Travis Kelsey goes off the board and George Kittle go off the board. Those are the only two tight ends I would consider. And honestly, if you've watched my content, I'm personally somebody who doesn't take a tight end early, maybe in best ball formats. If I'm stacking the chiefs, I'll take Travis Kelsey, but for the most part, I'm not going to end up getting there. So with my third pick in this draft, I go Clyde Edwards Slayer. And the running backs that were left on the board were Devin Singletary, Le'Veon Bell, Chris Carson, Jonathan Taylor, Melvin Gordon, all those types of guys. I have Clyde Edwards Alaire a pretty good amount higher than all of those players. Clyde Edwards Alaire is currently my RB14 for the Kansas City Chiefs. The next closest player would have been Chris Carson, who is my RB17, who is still left on the board. I mean, you're getting Kansas City Chiefs running backs up when they're in an offense and starting with Patrick Mahomes. They average 1.7 touchdowns per game. That's insane just between rushing and receiving. You're getting a situation where last year they were bottom 10 in rushing yards, but we don't care too much about the rushing yards for Clyde Edwards Alaire. We just care more about the receiving game upside. You have one year left on Damian Williams contract, but he's going to be involved. Like, yes, taking Clyde Edwards Lair with the third pick, there's risk there, but I think there's a high enough floor due to his pass catching ability and the offense that he's in. And just the fact that Damian Williams has not been able to stay healthy, but Damian Williams is definitely going to be involved. He's been a huge piece for them, especially in the playoffs the past two years. And he was a decent pass protector. You have Patrick Mahomes out there, the best player in all of football. Clyde Edwards Lair has been knocked about his pass catching work. Maybe he can improve it by the time the season starts, but if he can't, Damian Williams is going to have a, a clear role in this offense at the very least of like 30 to 40% of the snaps when the season starts. And every projection that I run, even when I'm being pessimistic about Clyde Edwards Lair. He's borderline top 15 is where I have him at right now at RB14. And if that's the case, I'm fine spending a top three pick on him in drafts, at least if it's PPR format. He enters an offense that last year threw the ball to running back 6.6 times per game and 5.6 receptions per game to these running backs. I like to spot 55 receptions last year at LSU. A lot of them were honestly check downs, only had one receiving touchdown. That's not that great. His efficiency numbers in college on his receptions were actually worse than Jonathan Taylor's, which people don't realize because they only look at the overall pure volume of actual work, which it's obviously going to be more for Clyde Edwards Lair based on the offense he was in and the fact that they played more games going into the national championship. But Edwards Lair, I like him at that spot. Now we're in the fourth round. I'm not picking a wide receiver yet because that's the strategy. Zero wide receiver strategy. So it comes back to me and I pretty much have to choose between Chris Carson, Le'Veon Bell, Jonathan Taylor and Melvin Gordon at this point. I end up going out and getting Chris Carson. He was my highest ranked running back left on the board. Chris Carson right now, as I record this, is my running back 17. Melvin Gordon is my running back 18. Le'Veon Bell is my running back 19. And Jonathan Taylor is my running back 20. So they're all very close in terms of which one I wanted to get. The fact that I already have Clyde Edwards Lair, a rookie, I didn't feel the need to take Jonathan Taylor there. I personally do like Chris Carson more than Le'Veon Bell. It was a very close coin flip. They're in the same tier for me. My tier four of running backs to end that tier is Chris Carson, then Melvin Gordon. And for right now, I'll take Chris Carson. If we get closer to the season, I'm only going like Chris Carson more because everything indicates that Rashad Penny is not going to be with the team when the season starts. And if you get no running back signed in Seattle, then I like Chris Carson. Now, of course, if we get more information before the season starts and Carlos Hyde or LaShawn McCoy or somebody, Devonta Freeman is now in Seattle. Yeah, that hurts Chris Carson. I would have taken Melvin Gordon there. Chris Carson coming off his own injury and just in general, but this team loves to run the ball. Last year when he was healthy and actually playing, he was a top eight running back. He was a borderline top five running back in, in non-PPR and half PPR formats. He was a top 10 running back, even in PPR formats. There was all the hype in the preseason that made him go from a sixth round pick to a fourth round pick to a third round pick once they said he's going to catch the ball more and he comes out week one and catches like four passes last year and then that's what ends up happening he was a good pass catcher for them he was very stable Chris Carson even had the fumbling issues so many times three four fumbles and they still they still want to put him in the game then Rashad Penny gets hurt in the midst of all those fumbling issues and Chris Carson's able to retain the workload there and then Chris Carson gets hurt and obviously we know the rest from there they lose in the playoffs so Chris Carson here as long as he's healthy and the fact that there's no real depth behind him and the only depth is going to be an injured Rashad Penny Penny, and then a rookie in DJ Dallas. I don't think DJ Dallas is going to push right away Chris Carson. Pete Carroll loves Chris Carson and so do the Seahawks. So he's my running back four. My first four picks in this draft, Alvin Cook, Josh Jacobs, Clyde Edwards, Lair, and Chris Carson. Obviously one of these guys is going to be on my bench each week, depending on the league that you're in. There's one flex spot on this one. If you're in a two flex league, this is a fantastic start because you can start all these guys. But now we start to get to my wide receivers. 
We just implied the zero wide receiver strategy. My fifth pick, my first wide receiver off the board, second year player, DK Metcalf. And I'm, I'm as high as ever on DK Metcalf. And, and I'm not sure many people can kind of sway me from that. I'm extremely high on DK Metcalf. I mean, he led the entire league last year in end zone targets, end zone percentage of his team's target share, 18.6. 18 overall end zone targets that is specifically in the end zone, not in the red zone. His route progression was fantastic. During the second half of the year, he ended up out targeting Tyler Lockett. When you factor in the two playoff schemes, he out targeted Tyler Lockett by a good chunk as well. He's just a physical specimen. I mean, you're talking about a guy who's an absolute monster on the outside and he was able to actually generate separation earlier than most rookie wide receivers do. He was having success literally in week one of last year. He ended up getting a little bit of a nagging injury, but then the big success comes in the second half where his route tree, the amount of routes he was running went from instead of just running straight verticals, up the left side of the field, he started towards those final quarter of the games and especially in the playoffs, crossing the field a lot more, using double moves, a lot of things that once you're a rookie, you start to develop maybe in your second year. He was doing it towards the end of his first year and he started to break out. That's a piece that I want. And if you're getting DK Metcalf, you, you usually you can get him in the sixth round. I took him in the fifth round here because on my next turn, there's no way he was still going to be on the board. I feel really good about that. Like I am very much convinced that DK Metcalf can be a top five wide receiver in this league in one to two years. The offense that he's in kind of limits him a little bit based on the fact that they run the ball nonstop in their current system. By the end of this year, I think DK Metcalf could be a borderline top 10 wide receiver. I feel very strongly about that. So I like the pick with DK Metcalf for myself. It comes back around and you can see my next two picks are wide receivers. So I go four running backs to start and now we're starting to go, okay, we're using zero wide receiver. Let's load up in the middle, the late rounds on wide receivers. I go Will Fuller there. Then I go Debo Samuel. Will Fuller and Debo Samuel are back to back in my rankings. I have Will Fuller at wide receiver 30 overall. I have Debo at wide receiver 31. So I was very happy to see that Debo actually followed these like final eight picks right back around to me. After I took Fuller, Marvin Jones and Edelman went off the board at wide receiver, but then no more wide receivers went off the board because people are now loading up on running backs because I took all the running backs early on. People took maybe their first or second guys. Now in the mid rounds, they're starting to get another running back. They're starting to pick up a quarterback as we approach the seventh round. And I'm just saying, you know what? I'm waiting on quarterback. I'm going to wait on tight end a little bit. Let me get these wide receivers. So I get Will Fuller. I get Debo Samuel. And Debo Samuel, I'm much lower on than most people. I think like I think consensus is a little bit higher than where I have him at 31 right now. But I feel good about if you're getting him as your wide receiver three, like I did here. I just don't want him as my wide receiver two. You're in run first offense. You're behind George Kittle. They just drafted Brandon Ayuk as well. You led the league last year for wide receivers in rushing yards, and you had three rushing touchdowns, which made up around 20% of your overall production, 17.8% or so. Although some people are using that as a positive for him. Oh, he's in the Kyle Shanahan offense. He's getting these end arounds. He's getting these design runs. It's great. I can easily see that just dropping. What if he loses half his yards? What if he has the exact same yards, but only scores one touchdown and not three, and he loses 12 fantasy points? His ranking overall, his ADP, his consensus, his finish is going to be much lower. So those are the negatives about Debo, but when you're getting him in the seventh round, instead of where he's lately going in the fifth or sixth round on a lot of people reaching on him because of recency bias, again, these recency bias teams, last NFL game you saw, Debo Samuel was in it. And he was probably the best player on offense and overall player in that game outside of Joey Bosa for the 49ers. Recency bias hits a lot of people, but once he settles out, if he's actually going to be there in the end of the sixth beginning of the seventh round and he's not your wide receiver two but your wide receiver three i feel good about that real quick get the rookie rankings they're free i'll be sending out my first round of ppr rankings as well to all those people probably by today so get the rookie rankings get into the discord down below we're already chatting in there lots of people filing in there every single day it's a pretty fun time so thanks everybody let's get back into this beautiful video the rest of the seventh round ends just looking at some other things here you can see tight ends starting to come off the board austin hooper gets reached on it austin hooper for me right now i'm really low on him he keeps falling he's like my tight end 12 or 13 i think i put him down to 13 now i'm not high on austin hooper now most people might have him borderline top eight. I'm personally not there. He's going from the number one passing offense in the entire league. He's now going to an offense that I think is going to be improved by a good margin in Cleveland, but nowhere near the same passing. And he's not going to be a weapon there in terms of being a priority as he was in Atlanta for Matt Ryan. Yeah, Austin Hooper is going to be, in my opinion, when you factor in just the priorities, the running game, Odell, Jarvis Landry, those are going to be the priorities in this offense. And then even in the passing game, Kareem Hunt might be more of a priority. So I'm very low on him. I just saw his name pop out in red. So going into now the eighth round, you can see I end up picking uh, my fifth running back. So this was a spot where I could have got my fourth receiver or my fifth running back. Wide receiver is so deep this year that you can get loads of wide receiver threes, honestly, in like the 10th round of your draft. So I already got three of them. So wide receiver fours, I'm definitely going to find down there. Why not pick up a fifth running back? Because Darius Geis is here at the 8.08 and he fell a lot. Like my overall rank on Darius Geis is running back 26 this year. And look, obviously things can go wrong. Antonio Gibson can play a lot as a running back for them. That hurts. They still have Adrian Peterson there. They pretty much signed every possible running back they could. I mean, listen to the running backs that Washington signed. So they already have Peterson, right? They gave him some money. They got Antonio Gibson in the draft, who's going to be this gadget guy. They're comparing him to Christian McCaffrey. All right, let's hold our horses now. But then you get Bryce Love, who was injured last year. They go out, they sign Peyton Barber from Tampa Bay. They go out, they sign JD McKissick from the Lions. They're just bringing in all these dusty old pieces. And a bit, it's a big reason why. It's similar to Carryon Johnson. I mean, Darius Geis, he's had two knee injuries in his first two years. And obviously, he's had more than that. He's re injured that thing before he was able to step on the football field while he was at college before the season started in the preseason. So there's big concerns with his knee. But if he's my running back five, if Darius Geis is the running back five on my team, because I went four running backs with my first four 
four picks. And now that's my upside, like my fifth running back overall. If he busts, I'm fine because I got four other guys ahead of him. But if he pops off, now I have a possible top 20, top 15 running back as my fifth running back. Yeah, I like that a lot. So the risk in taking get Darius Geis because of these knee injuries, because of the offense that he plays in and a lot of running backs being back there and the ageless wonder, Adrian Peterson and Antonio Gibson out of the draft, right? All these, all these factors, you can just fade them all away because you're saying, yeah, he's my RB5 though. Cancel all those out. But think about the upside now at this pick. Whereas if you go two running backs to start, then you get two or three receivers and maybe you pick a quarterback in the seventh and now you're getting to Darius Geis as your RB3, there's a lot more risk there. You rely on him. He's a starting running back for you now if somebody gets hurt ahead of him. He's a flex option in consideration for you each week. Right now, he's not even close to a flex option need for me. He's a consideration, but I don't need to put him there. So I like that pick at eight. I come back around to number nine, and this is a spot where I'm very curious as why Tyler Higby fell to the ninth round, but I think he's just falling there. Like I have him as my tight end seven right now. He goes off the board as the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninth tight end. Guys that went ahead of him that I would not have taken ahead of him would be Austin Hooper and Hunter Henry by a wide margin. Hunter Henry's my tight end 10. Austin Hooper's my tight end 12 or 13. Last time I checked, and I have Tyler Higby as my tight end seven. So normally I wouldn't go with a tight end here. It's the ninth round. I just choose a tight end 10th round. Like Hayden Hurst was still on the board. You could see Hayden Hurst goes at a little bit down here towards the bottom of the screen in the 11th round. Like I normally would just wait on Hayden Hurst, but I thought Tyler Higby was such a good value there that I ended up snagging him. I mean, this is what Tyler Higby did the final eight games of the season last year. And this is exactly why I took him with the ninth pick here. Tyler Higby last year, throughout the final eight games in 2019, he was third in fantasy points overall for tight ends with 119.4. First in red zone targets with 17 amongst tight ends. First with four games of 100 plus yards. First in receptions, 51. First in targets, 64. And second in yards with 564. That was during those final eight games of the season last year. Obviously, Gerald Everett was hurt during that time, but they switched to 12 personnel. 12 personnel means the first number in that is how many running backs are on the field. The second number in that is how many tight ends are in the field. And then you just know based on the remaining players, how many wide receivers are on the field. So 12 personnel is one running back, two tight ends, and two wide receivers. You switch to 12 personnel and Tyler Higby just explodes. So give me Tyler Higby. I think he'll be drafted around that by the time the season starts, tight end eight range. Got him as a tight end nine in this draft in the ninth round. I like that a lot. So my current roster stands five running backs, three receivers, and I got my tight end. I wait on quarterbacks. If you know me, I'm going to wait till like the 10th round on quarterbacks. I'll get one and then I might not even draft the backup and just pick him up on the waiver wire after the draft. Think about who I want to drop. But if I scroll down, you can see the final five picks right now. Deontay Johnson is still on the board and I take him in the 10th round. He's currently going right around the 10th pick. So this is right where his ADP is. I am extremely high on Deontay Johnson. Most people are going to have him graded around a wide receiver 40, wide receiver 45. I am very high on Deontay Johnson. Deontay Johnson is my wide receiver 34 this year. And I mean, that's me betting on Big Ben being somewhat healthy. And obviously that can go really wrong if Deontay Johnson turns out as wide receiver 45, but he was able to get it done last year with Duck Hodges. He was able to outperform Juju, who was of course injured, but even in an efficiency metric, Deontay Johnson was second among all receivers last year in broken tackles. And he was the number one receiver in separation. Number one receiver as a rookie. He was obviously a special teams player as well. He performed good there for the Steelers. He scored a touchdown on special teams, a return. I'm very high on him. He's one of my must draft value wide receivers at this point. It's very good to see what he did. He was able to last year, starting in week three from when he was healthy to week 10 with Juju, outperformed Juju in a ton of areas. He ran less routes than Juju during that time, and he still ended up seeing more receptions. He ended up seeing only 20 less yards, scored the same amount of touchdowns. But the big thing, his wide receiver rating when targeted was 130.8, whereas Juju's was 87.7. And that means that he was just more efficient when wide receivers were targeting him. And that's because he was getting that separation. That's because after the catch, he was breaking tackles. He was one of the hidden gems last year. I think people will realize him more and more as the season goes on and the summer goes on. Maybe he'll start to get drafted in the eighth round. Getting Deontay Johnson right now is like a 10th round pick in your drafts. It's probably like the most optimal outcome. I then go right back to another wide receiver there. So I have five wide receivers now on my team and I like a lot of them. Preston Williams is another guy in the 11th round. He's one of my must draft value wide receivers as well right now. Yes, we'll see what happens. A lot of the success he had last year, about half of it was with Josh Rosen. Ryan Fitzpatrick comes in, keeps targeting Preston Williams a lot, but then also starts to favor maybe a little bit more Devontae Parker. Preston Williams gets hurt week eight, but Preston Williams is the number two player on a per game basis, only behind Devontae Adams in red zone target share at 37%. Devontae Adams had a 39.7% target share. Preston Williams averaged 11.6 fantasy points per game as a rookie last year in a Miami offense that is now much improved and much more talented of an overall team. To put that in perspective, you can see the tweet right here by David Zatch. Be sure to follow him. You can see Terry McLaurin averaged 13.7 fantasy points per game. And we thought Terry McLaurin was fantastic last year, especially the first half of the season. That's exactly what Preston Williams is doing very close to it, averaging close to 12 fantasy points per game. Matthew Stafford, I'm continuously getting in the 12th round. He is my he is my quarterback 12. I have him as a QB1 this year, right on the edge of it. QB1s are uh, 1 to 12. QB2s are 13 to 24, right? That's how you rank it based on who would start in a 12-person league. I got a QB1 in the 12th round is what that says. I like that. I come back around to round 13. I get Nikhil Harry, who in my opinion, yes, Julian Edelman's still in the slot, but Nikhil Harry is, is talent-wise and overall just factoring in health and, and upside at his age. He's the number one receiver, in my opinion. And I think Jared Stidham 
and this whole offense is being undervalued. Yes, I don't think they're going to be world beaters, but everybody's just banking on them being the worst offense in the league, which maybe they are. But I think that we have to see how it plays out. At the very worst, if this is the worst offense in the league and you get a borderline wide receiver one on that team in Nikhil Harry in the 13th round, fine. Like, how does it hurt you? He's he's my wide receiver six. But what if it's an average offense? And now his average draft position as the wide receiver one in New England's offense potentially is like the 10th round. Now you're getting a great value in the 13th round. What if this is an above average offense? I mean, they're expected to win nine games based on Vegas. What if it's an above average offense and Nikhil Harry is in an above average offense as the borderline or the number one receiver. And now his average draft position should have been in the seventh or eighth round. You're getting him in the 13th round. I think there's no downside in where any of these guys are being drafted right now. And then finally, my last pick in this draft, I get a backup tight end. Normally I don't go backup tight ends, but I'm really high on Chris Herndon. Chris Herndon is my tight end 18. I like that. Look, last year he was obviously hurt, suspended. He only sees like one target. He barely plays any games in like the one game he comes back. He just kept on it re-injuring himself. But I think there's a lot of meat on the bone still for Chris Herndon. I think there's a lot of upside for him. If you just think a few years back, he was an absolute beast for this team. He was balling out on an efficiency match. He was a top eight tight end in the league, and now he gets hurt. He gets injured last year. There's no more recency bias. We all forget about what happens two years ago for almost every player. It's what have you done for me lately? But he was an elite tight end. He was a breakout candidate for last year. He could have been a borderline top six, top five tight end last year. And I think he still has that upside if he can just get on the field. The offense should be improved. The offensive line, without a doubt, is going to be improved for the Jets. And there's really no true alpha number one receiver in New York. You have Denzel Mims, a rookie, Rashad Perriman, who's now in his fifth, sixth year, and he's never been great until the end of last year where everybody got hurt in number one passing offense in Tampa Bay. And then you have a slot receiver in Crowder, who I really do like, but he's not an alpha true number one down the field. There's a lot for Chris Herndon there, in my opinion. So that was that was the 14 rounds. I'll put up my entire draft now, like on the board here, um, but I can sort this by overall team and we can get a look at it that way as well by roster here on Fantasy Pros, which is nice. So this is my team column right here. I'll zoom in on your team and we'll scroll down through it quickly, but I'll also pop up just a little express sheet of everything. So you have Matt Stafford, Dalvin Cook, Josh Jacobs. So those are my, my starters right there. This is based on your starters. The, me, my three starting receivers, DK Metcalf, Will Fuller, and Debo. Obviously, I have no true alpha number one, but these are all guys who are top 30 receivers, borderline. Debo's my 31st, Will Fuller's my 30th, and DK is my 22nd, I believe, ranked wide receiver right now. Go down. I have Tyler Higby, who I feel really good about. Now I have my flex option is Clyde Edwards Hilaire, but my running backs on my bench and or can be easily put into my lineup any week, Chris Carson and Darius Geis. That feels really good. My wide receiver depth. Okay. I, I don't really know. Maybe I don't want to start one of these guys. Maybe I, they just stink. Will Fuller gets hurt again like he usually does. I got Deontay Johnson here, who's a breakout guy for me. He's a top 35 receiver. I got Preston Williams here, who's a borderline top 40 receiver for me right now. I believe Preston Williams is currently ranked as my 42 wide receiver. I like that. I get Nikhil Harry as my wide receiver six, a guy who I think, again, I just mentioned how underpriced he is. And then Chris Herndon as a backup. So I went four running backs to start this draft. I ended up in the draft with five overall running backs, two tight ends, a quarterback, and six wide receivers. And my six wide receivers for zero wide receiver strategy end up being DK Metcalf, Will Fuller, Debo Samuel, Deontay Johnson, Preston Williams, and Nikhil Harry. And out of all these guys, I think DK Metcalf is a borderline wide receiver one on his specific team. I think Will Fuller is going to be a borderline wide receiver one on his specific team. Debo is clearly behind George Kittle, but that's fine. Deontay Johnson is going to be pushing Juju, I think, but he's clearly behind him right now. Preston Williams, wide receiver two. So I got a bunch of wide receiver twos with wide receiver one upside on their specific teams. I like that. Give me six of them. If two hit off, similar to the zero RB approach we talked about at the top of the show, I think that makes a lot of sense. Let me know what you think of this. Let me know what you think of the zero wide receiver approach. I think it might be something that we could look into. Like, I really like getting all these running backs. Oh, Sal, you only need to start three running backs. Well, what if you're in a what if you're in a two flex league? That feels good. But okay, let's just think about it this way. Like, I understand that one of them is going to sit for you if you're only in a two running backs, one flex type of a league setup. But I, I still like it. Like I feel great about these receivers. I'm very high on DK. I'm okay on on Will Fuller and, and Debo Samuel. I'm very high on Deontay Johnson and Preston Williams, and I think the Kill Harry's slept on. So I feel good about my receivers this year. I obviously feel great about my running backs, my tight ends. I feel good about, and my quarterback and Matt Stafford. I feel strong about. So. I don't hate this team. I like this team a lot. I'm very surprised that zero wide receiver strategy actually worked well in this one. And I guess it makes sense based on the depth that we have at wide receiver and no depth at running back. So uh, let me know what you think of this. Let me know if you're doing this strategy at all, if you will consider doing it in the future. But before you go, hit the big old subscribe button. If you enjoyed this video, if you're like, hey, that's pretty cool, or you like my content, check out some more of my deeper dive analysis. I can assure you there's no better content for free on the interwebs right now than my deeper dive YouTube videos right now on specific topics. So check that out. My name is Sal Vetri. Thank you for tuning in. Get into the Discord. It's totally free. Get the free rookie rankings. They're totally free down below right now. Big old subscribe button just popped up. Hit that notification bell. Thank you so much, everybody. This was fun. I'll be back tomorrow. Every single day, we're pumping out content here on the channel. Appreciate you tuning in. Can't wait for the football season. Can't wait for the preseason. It's getting close by every single day. Thanks for tuning into another video. You all rock. See you in the next one.